is Sam Thomas, who comes from Utah. He's going to be presenting on corneal transplants, the global need, and an innovative solution, and some work that he's done here with Dr. Ambani. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, uh, as was said, my name is Samuel Thomas, fourth year medical student on a neuro ophthalmology rotation right now. Uh, I had the great opportunity of working with Dr. Ambani on this project last year. Um, I had the opportunity to do a, a year of, of bio innovation and engineering, and this was one of the great projects that I got to work on. Um, as well as I worked with Alexis Johnson, Blair Garrett, Kevin Bryant, and Thomas Newell, who are undergraduate students in the bioengineering department. And so excited to tell you a little bit more about um, what innovative solutions we're trying to, to come up with for corneal transplants in, in the global sphere. So three things that I, three questions I hope to address in this, in this talk is, um, first, I'll address what is, uh, what kind of impact does corneal bioengineering have in the world? Number two, how is it treated in the U.S. and Europe? And number three, how do we expand that treatment to have a, a global impact? And so here is, is a, just a, a diagram showing the, the impact of corneal blindness in the world. This comes from the WHO. I have it ranked in order of, of most common causes of corneal blindness to the least. You can see the cataracts is 48% is, is a large part of, of corneal blindness, or a large part of just blindness worldwide. Corneal opacities come up at four. But I highlighted six, seven, and eight as well because they also have a component of, of corneal blindness associated with them. And so I kind of grouped them together and they kind of add up to be about 15% of the world blindness can be attributed to corneal um, disease. If you look through the literature, you can find varying numbers on all of these statistics. Uh, is highly dependent on, on what the uh, epidemic of disease is in that area. Some places in Africa said that 90% of their blindness was due to corneal um, disease. And so you can see that this is uh, from the WHO, but it can vary pretty drastically. One thing the WHO did say was that corneal disease is the most common cause of bilateral blindness, is the most important cause of bilateral blindness, second only to the cataracts. This is because it is a preventable and treatable cause uh, as well. And here's just an image of a, of a child with bilateral corneal um, disease. And so looking at uh, corneal blindness specifically, looking at three different areas, India, Tanzania, and China, I've listed just the top three reasons for corneal disease in those specific areas. And you can see that they, they vary pretty differently. Um, and so we're not talking about just one type of disease. And here, uh, to talk about the numbers, there's about 45 million people who are blind worldwide. About 8 million of those people estimated have corneal disease, and the mainstay treatment for these patients is the definitive treatment is a corneal transplant. And so treatment for corneal blindness, uh, the first being corneal transplants. There's uh, obviously corneal transplants are where the diseased cornea is removed and a donor cornea is, is brought in and sutured to the eye. There's about 47,000 of these done in the U.S. Costs about $12,000 for the tissue to do it. It's about $16,000 to do the full procedure was what one study told me. Um, if in the United States, if a patient fails this once, twice, and, and it's considered not smart to do it again, that's when you go to this karyto keratoplasthesis or an artificial cornea. The most popular being this Boston Capro. And this is the one that I want to focus on with you because the solution that we have is kind of a variation of this Boston Capro. There's about 500 done each year. It costs about $5,000 for this device. And it involves a front part that transmits the light, the corneal graft, the back plate, which is something that I'll, I'll emphasize later on, and then a locking C-ring in the back. Other artificial corneas include this Alphacore and the OOKP, but we'll focus on this one for now. Um, the other technology, just to, for, for completeness, for treating corneal blindness can be this phototherapeutic uh, keratectomy. Um, so not feasible for the developing world at this point, so we won't talk too much about it. But I want to highlight again th that transplant tissue obviously requires donor tissue. But so does this Boston Capro, requires donor tissue for the most part. And so <coughs> this is where we kind of address the issue of, of treating corneal transplants in, in the global sphere. So going and trying to find some data on eye banks, I found this report, 2014 statistical report from the Eye Bank Association of America, noted that out of the 76 eye banks in the US, they got a total of 128,000 uh, eyes collected. And they used 76,000 of those. And so we have a, almost a surplus of, of eyes. Uh, internationally, the only data that I could find from this report 
was that there was 10 institutions that reported having collecting 6,000 and using 5,000 of those. It was, it was obvious in trying to do this search and find these numbers that there's a severe lack of infrastructure for high banks that can provide this donor tissue. And so my big take home point for this is that the places with the greatest burden of disease are the ones that have the least availability to treatment. And so uh, the need statement, so understanding those aspects, uh, we kind of came up with a need statement that there's a need for a better artificial cornea for the developing world. And our main goal was to eliminate the need for, or, or eliminate the dependence on the donor tissue. Other secondary goals would be things like, you know, uh, and ways that we will talk about doing that is a minimal incision to avoid sutures, reducing surgery time, maintaining and extending the lifetime of device for better tissue integration. These are all other things that we have to keep in mind. And there, there's a, quite a long list of specific um, requirements that we need to meet to actually make a good solution to this problem. But the main thing that we were trying to tackle is how can we eliminate the dependence on donor tissue. And so, again, to restate the problem, here's the, or the Boston Capro. Requires donor tissue. The incision usually involves an eight millimeter incision of the cornea in the surface. That's because that back plate that I showed you is eight millimeters in diameter. Um, and it often takes months to years sometimes to recover from this surgery. It is obviously very invasive, very involved. And there's been uh, issues with poor tissue incorporation and, and tissue longevity. Uh, oftentimes we'll have corneal melt and things like that. I don't have those numbers for you, but this is something that we just wanted to keep in mind. We don't want to make this issue worse. If we can make it better, that would be great. And so what we designed, or what we tried to figure out is how can we um, solve these problems? First, we're going to try and eliminate the need for the graft, and I'll talk about how we do that in the next slide. We're going to try and do it through a smaller incision, a three millimeter incision. That won't require any sutures. We'll hopefully try and decrease the re recovery time by having a less invasive surgery, and we can hopefully improve the device incorporation and, and device longevity again with a uh, less invasive procedure and with maybe doing some interesting um, biologic work with how what this back plate might look like. So this is the solution that we came up with. So shape memory potential, or so shape memory. A lot of you might be familiar with nitinol um, and the shape memory idea. Uh, if you ever want to know how nitinol works, you can YouTube night and all paper clip and you kind of see how it works. It's kind of interesting. I was going to try and upload it here, but from all the medical school lectures that I saw with people trying to upload videos, it never works. And so I'll let you kind of do it at home. But it's, it's basically, you can have a shape, uh, either metal or a plastic uh, polyurethane that has a specific shape. You can then warm it up or bend it into whatever shape you want it to. And it will return to that cured state if you would heat it up to that, that specific temperature. So it has these transition points. Um, as, and you can, by the way that you make this nitinol, which is just a, an alloy of, of nickel and titanium, or the, by, by the way that you make this polyurethane, you can pick at what temperature you want this shape to regain its form. So you cure it at a specific shape that you want to keep it in. You can change its shape to make it more compact, which is what we're going to try and do. And then you can warm it back up, cool it so it stays that way. Warm it back up, and it will take that original shape. And so it's, it's a really interesting way to, to compact things and to have them reform uh, wherever you need it to just based solely on, on the temperature of its environment. And so we first started with this shape memory polyurethane. The reason we, we did that was because it's easier to work with. We wanted just to test the idea. Can we make a device with this shape memory polyurethane that works? Um, and then I'll talk about this nickel, or this, this nitinol later. The, the huge advantage of this, highly biocompatible, uh, seen in stents, a lot of orthopedic devices. And uh, it's, it's actually similar to the latest Boston K-Pro that uses titanium. So we know that this type of metal um, has worked for similar devices in the past. So that was our approach. And, that was, and this is the image of what that back plate looks like. So you can see that it's this eight millimeter device. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, warm it up so we can shape it, taco it, freeze it so that it, it keeps that shape, ship it as needed like that. And then once it goes back in the eye in a small incision, you could put warm saline in the eye to, eight to 39 degrees Celsius, and it would retake that shape. And then you could assemble it while it's in the eye. And so that's what we tried to do. So you can see here is, is the engineering that we did to do that. To talk about that front part, clear part of the, the Boston K-Pro, the ceiling, and then that back plate that I talked about. 
This was the, the product. So this is something that was made out of that polyurethane, this shape memory. So this is what we warmed up, tacoed, put into a minimal incision, and then warmed back up with warm saline so that we could put this, these three pieces together. And so, again, how it works, warm it up, able to shape it, pull it out, cool it, and it can keep that, it will maintain that shape as long as it's uh, not warmed back up. If you put it back in warm water, it will reform its original shape. And so what we decided to do is we're going to test this in pig eyes. And so we did exactly what, what I just mentioned. And uh, again, made the small incision, had the tacoed back piece, put it in the eye. And again, the only thing, so that the Boston Cape for the front piece comes in from the front, the only thing you get in from the side is that tacoed back plate as well as the C-ring, both that will fit within that minimal three millimeter incision. And then you warm, you, you send warm saline through the eye up to 39 degrees Celsius, and it will unfold that back plate. And then from there, it's just a, a simple assembly where you get the back plate on and you get the C-ring on. And you can see that this was, uh, that it has appropriately unfolded. You can't really see it too well here. I apologize for the quality of that image. Um, but you can see how we were able to assemble that device, making a minimal incision and just using warm saline to reshape that, that eye. And so the next step for us will be to try and machine nitinol to do a similar thing. The issue with this polyurethane, it was a great idea to, to test the, how this works, but it's not completely, uh, it wouldn't pass FDA approval for, for being a, a device in the eye necessarily, but nitinol definitely would. And so we're working now to machine nitinol and work with some of the nitinol experts here at the U to be able to do this. Uh, we have all the specifications that we need, what it needs to include, um, <coughs> and then we'll do a similar testing with the nitinol. Uh, acknowledgements, I want to thank Dr. Mbadi for all that he's done to, to pull me onto this project and to, to give his time and energy into to sharing his ideas on this and being a good mentor there. I also want to thank Dr. Roscoe who was able to mentor me on my, my uh, engineering year last year. I couldn't have had two better mentors. And with that, I'll, I'll move to questions. Right. From the research that I saw, I think it, and I could be wrong on this, um, but I thought that you could warm it up to about 40, 41 degrees before you ha start having some damage. And so we thought that putting it at, at 38 degrees would be appropriate because you could slightly get a little bit warmer than, than what it needs to transform, but not warm enough to hurt the eye. So that's, that's a great question. Yes, Dr. Warner. So the way that they use the Boston Capro right now is they will assemble the Boston Capro on donor tissue, and then they will transplant that back onto the patient. And so instead, if I go back a few slides, you can see how, with how the Boston Capro is used right now, is they'll remove the diseased tissue, and they'll have donor tissue that they assemble the Boston Capro onto outside the body. They'll assemble it, and then they'll suture it back onto the patient. And so there are some instances in developing countries where if the person has bilateral corneal abrasions, what they can do is they can, and they don't have donor tissue, they can remove uh, tissue from one eye to be used for the other. But currently the Boston Capro does need that, that cornea and tissue, that donor, to be sandwiched in between the two pieces on the, the Boston Capro. So we're hoping to be able to keep that diseased cornea in place, create the hole for the, the top piece, and be able to get that back piece in without having to um, compromise the structure of the existing cornea as is. Because the kind of the cool idea about this as well is that with these diseased corneas, uh, a lot of times the issue is that you, you just lose the, op the opacity. You, you, the structure of the cornea oftentimes is, is still there. Um, and so we can kind of utilize that to keep our, our Boston Capro in place without having to, to use the donor tissue. So.
That's a great question. And the interesting thing about nitinol to me is when I first heard about nitinol being used as uh, used in the body, I know that there was a there is an issue with, with nickel being biocompatible in the body. But for some reason, this combination of, of nickel and titanium has been used in stents and other orthopedic devices. And, and I don't know the exact the, the rates, but I know that the FDA is, is completely fine with using um, nitinol uh, in, in these devices. But that's a good question. I don't, I don't know exactly how many times there's uh, comping mountains. All right. I think we should uh, thank Sam and move on to the next talk. Okay. So we have